All right, let's see. So y'all, we're going to continue on. We have talked about the lymphatic system, and um, we mentioned while we were talking about the lymphatic system that one of the main jobs of your lymphatic system is that it provides a structural framework for your immune system. Not all of it, but um, especially for a very important branch of your immune system called the adaptive immune system. So I'm going to divide the immune system up into two video clips. And I have to tell you, the immune system is fairly complex. We're just going to kind of hit some highlights and some basic topics here in Biology 202, AMP2. When you take uh, your microbiology course, you will hear some additional details about the immune system. But we're just going to try to kind of hit the highlights and some general concepts for now. All right, what is the purpose of your immune system? Um, I think we all know resistance to disease. The, the function of your immune system is to remove foreign invaders to the body. And usually those are microorganisms like bacteria and yeast and viruses, etc. cetera. Um, but they can also be things like pollen, um, mold spores, um, anything that is foreign, like a splinter, for example, that gets down into deep into your skin, down in your dermis where it's not supposed to be. Your immune system is supposed to dissolve and, and remove that as well. If you have a transplant with uh, an organ or blood from another person who is not a good tissue match for you, your body will also see that as foreign and the immune system will try to eliminate it. So your immune system is involved in defense. It has two major branches, which are being referred to here as intrinsic system. Let's just call those branches. You have the innate branch and you have the adaptive branch. Innate refers to like you're born with this type of immunity. It's nonspecific. Um, this is a branch of your immune system that reacts to bacteria in general, viruses in general, yeast in general. The adaptive immune system on the other hand, is a uh, really a more powerful branch of the immune system in many ways. It is very specific, okay, in what it responds to. So the adaptive branch of your immune system will respond to the H1N1 flu if you get exposed to it, um, but it's not going to respond to something else. It'll respond to Salmonella bacteria if you're unfortunate enough to eat some nasty a potato salad at a picnic that has salmonella in it, but it's not going to react to any other type of bacteria or virus or other microorganism. Um, so th this branch of your immune system requires exposure for immunity to develop, for resistance to a particular infectious disease to occur. Let's talk about uh, how the immune system is divided up. Okay, so again, you have these innate defenses and you have adaptive defenses, or some people call those acquired defenses. And again, this requires exposure. Your innate defenses you are born with. They don't require prior exposure. Again, not going to go into a lot of gory details here. Your first line of defense to invading microorganisms, your skin and the mucous membranes. And you've learned about that before. The skin, uh, the epidermis has very tightly packed epithelial cells located there. You have the keratin fibers located all along the surface. Uh, of the skin, which also help function as a tight barrier. And uh, the skin is the key barrier that keeps microorganisms out of deeper portions of your body. So it's very crucial, obviously. And then you also have your mucous membranes. Remember, these are the coverings, the linings of 
spaces inside your body that, that somewhere along the way have an exit to the outside. So the lining of your respiratory tract, your digestive tract, your urinary tract, your reproductive tract. Um, you also have very tightly packed epithelial tissue there as well that helps prevent microbes from moving past there and into deeper tissue. So that's really your first line of defense. And there also are some um, defensive type protein chemicals that are located there as well that uh, sometimes eliminate microbes and sometimes they don't, but they're part of the weaponry there. And you'll learn more about those in, in, uh, in microbiology. All right, now, uh, hey, those barriers are great. Sometimes microbes get past them, though, and so we need to have a way to quickly react against invading microbes. If you get cut, we get cut all the time, even little microscopic cuts that maybe we're not aware of, and those cuts always introduce microorganisms down into deeper tissues. Your skin is completely covered with microorganisms. Everything that we touch all day, completely covered with microorganisms. That's normal, but we don't want those down into deeper, in the deeper tissues of our body. So when that happens, and it does very frequently, we do have a nice army that's ready to try to combat them. And that includes some cells that we refer to as phagocytes, phagocytic cells. We've talked about that already a little bit earlier on your white blood cell lecture. Uh, NK cells, you'll hear about those in micro. Um, and then you have some processes, inflammation and fever are two processes that play an important role. And there are some protein weapons that are available as well. And again, you'll hear more about those when you take your microbiology class. So all these things together, this is really first line, and then these guys here are your second lines of defense. Quick responders. That doesn't always work, though. Um, when you take microbiology, you're going to learn that the microorganisms that can make you ill, uh, they have shields that protect them, in a lot of cases, from your second line of defense. So therefore, then you're relying on this third line of defense, which we call your adaptive defenses. And these primarily involve the B cells and the T cells your lymphocytes. They generate specific responses to particular types of microbes, and they only become activated if you actually become exposed to something. All righty. So a little bit more. I think I've covered most of this actually already. Natural killer cells, you'll hear about that when you take microbiology. Um, but again, these are all part of the innate defenses, the second line. You have some phagocytes, um, the inflammatory response, we're going to talk about that. There are some antimicrobial proteins, which are essentially kind of like antibiotics that your uh, immune system produces to uh, help combat invading microbes, and in that process of fever. Let's talk about these phagocytic cells. These are a really important part of your militia, your army that's attacking these foreign invaders. Um, macrophages are really, really important. Hopefully you remember that monocytes in the bloodstream can become wandering macrophages in tissues. So they ooze around like an amoeba. They wander through tissues. Um, and they are able to bind things like bacteria, yeast, um, um, viruses, <laughs> etc. They bind these, they attach to them, and then they engulf them by phagocytosis. So many of them are wandering. And then in a lot of your tissues, you have what are called fixed macrophages, which they don't really wander around. They're just locked into place on a permanent basis. So you have some of these in your liver and then even in your brain. You have some of these fixed macrophages as well. Their job is to engulf invading microbes and also to engulf 
your damaged tissue parts and cells that need to be replaced. Another type of phagocytic cell, very important, you've already heard about these, the neutrophils, heard about those on your white blood cell uh, lecture. These are fast responders, if you guys remember. Um, really good at phagocytosing bacteria, especially. So if you have a cut, a burn, whatever, you have damage to a tissue that has allowed microbes to invade, these neutrophils are the first white blood cell type that tends to swarm out of your bloodstream and attacks these invading organisms. Macrophages tend to be a little bit slower in responding, but their, their response will last longer. Um, they tend to be more persistent. All right, here's just a, here's kind of a cool um, 3D uh, image generated with an electron microscope, and then it was computer enhanced, showing a human macrophage. And these little round guys are some round shaped bacterial cells. Those are bacteria. So you can see that the macrophage is sending out these little processes attaching to the bacteria, and now it's going to engulf and swallow and digest those bacteria. And your neutrophils do essentially the same thing. All right, so what is this process of phagocytosis? This is very important for your immune system function. This is essentially what has to happen in order for you to clear an invading microorganism from your body. And it's not overly complicated. The first thing, obviously, is that your phagocytic cell, so this might be a macrophage, it may be a neutrophil, has to bind to whatever it's going to get rid of. Um, it sends out these little projections. Those are called pseudopods or false feet that engulf the invading microbe, the debris or whatever. It brings those, these things that it has engulfed inside the cell in, in a membrane covered vesicle. The membrane covered vesicle fuses, remember those little organelles called lysosomes? You may have heard about those in your biology 201 class or an earlier class. Uh, a lysosome is full of digestive enzymes. They're sometimes called the stomachs of our cells. So in macrophages and neutrophils, what happens is these lysosomes fuse with these engulfed microbes. Those digestive enzymes do their work. Uh, microbes are built from proteins and lipids and carbohydrates and nucleic acids just like we are, and so those enzymes digest all of those important um, molecules. All right, and you're left over with basically the waste and the debris, and then through a process called exocytosis, this little vesicle, membrane-covered vesicle with all the wastes, travels back to the membrane of the phagocytic cell, dumps out all of the di digested parts. All right, and that's the whole process is called phagocytosis. Very important. Um, inflammation, your inflammatory response. What is this? What is? Uh, how does it happen? Why is it important? And we all know the signs of inflammation. We've seen these before. Redness, heat, swelling, and pain. And sometimes if you have extreme inflammation, you have so much swelling, it can actually reduce your ability to contract surrounding skeletal muscles and you'll wind up with, uh, with stiffness. Or you can have so much inflammation in a particular organ somewhere in your body that uh, it's no longer able to function very well. So inflammation is a process. This is part of your innate defenses, okay? So you don't ha need prior exposure to an, uh, an infectious organism for inflammation to happen. You guys know that. If you've ever sprained your ankle, it swells right away. Uh, when you have a really nasty cut, it turns red, it swells, it becomes painful almost immediately. Inflammation is an, an immediate, fast process. 
All right, let's say you have been so unfortunate that you have stabbed yourself with a nail, and this nail was covered with some bacteria, these little green things that we see here, which are grossly over-exaggerated in size, just to let you know. So that has pierced the skin. It's made it past the barrier. First line of defense has been breached. The bacteria are down here in the dermis of your skin where they're not supposed to be. That is, you're not supposed to have microbes down there. This sets off a um, very rapidly chemical signals are sent from these damaged tissues um, and you have cells in the dermis that detect the damage. They send chemical signals that start this process that we've talked about before. Remember diapedesis where we mentioned white blood cells are capable of squeezing out of capillaries and into surrounding tissues. So these chemical signals are sent to the blood vessels to make them dilate, to make them leakier, the walls of the, the cells in the walls of the blood vessels separate and allow white blood cells to migrate out. Yeah, that's what they're showing you here. Um, first thing that has to happen is white blood cells that are flowing here through your blood vessels, they need to attach to the wall of the blood vessel, and that's called margination, don't worry too much about that. And then the process by which they squeeze through the wall and get in here into the surrounding tissue is called diapedesis. And we've, you've, we use that term when we went over your white blood cells. Um, how do these white blood cells, especially your neutrophils and then later your monocytes that become macrophages wandering through these tissues, uh, they use chemotaxis, which means they can sense chemicals that have been released by damaged tissues. They can sense chemicals that are released by the invading bacteria and migrate towards them. It's kind of like a chemical trail of bread, bread crumbs. Because those chemicals are going to be more concentrated around areas where the damage has occurred, where the, uh, where the microbes are located. So they're going to travel towards those. They're going to home in on these invading critters like this process called chemotaxis, chemical trail of breadcrumbs. All right, and then once they get there, they're going to engulf, hopefully, the microbes and digest them through that process that we just looked at, phagocytosis. All right, why do you have during inflammation? Why does redness occur? That's because of the dilating blood vessels. They expand in size so you can see the, the red blood um, that is passing closer to the surface in greater amounts. Why does it get hot? Why do you feel the heat? That's also because of that warm blood that's typically down deeper in your tissues. More of it is now um, at a superficial location near the surface of the body. So you're going to feel that extra body heat. Why do you have swelling? because when these blood vessels dilate and become leaky, so white blood cells, and there are other things in the plasma um, that need to get out of the plasma to help fight with this battle, um, more fluids move out of the blood vessels into the surrounding tissue, so they swell. Your drainage ditches, your lymphatic tissues become a little bit overwhelmed with that. They can't drain off all of that excess tissue um, fluid. Alrighty, another process that's part of your innate defenses is fever. What's going on with, with fever? Um, basically what happens in a nutshell, you have these cells that carry out phagocytosis that engulf invading microorganisms and digest them. They secrete chemicals called pyrogens. These are basically chemicals these are secreted by macrophages and neutrophils that stimulate fever. Let's see. How do they do that? All right. Think back to Biology 201. You probably learned 
about the control center in your brain for temperature regulation. Hopefully you remember that is the hypothalamus. So pyrogens travel through the bloodstream to the hypothalamus and they stimulate your hypothalamus to reset the your body temperature set point. So they alter the homeostatic range for our body temperature tempor temporarily. Uh, your hypothalamus turns the thermostat up, causes an increase in your body temperature. Uh, how does it accomplish that? Um, what mechanisms do you use for generating body heat? Vasoconstriction and also shivering. That's why you shiver when you're developing a fever. That generates the body heat that raises temperature for fever. Um, there are benefits to moderate fever. Some of these we have not completely worked out yet. Um, one of the things though that it does, uh, chemical reactions tend to speed up with higher temperature. If you raise your body temperature, all these important chemical reactions of our metabolism increase in speed a little bit. So that will speed up repair. It also tends to speed up, or it's thought to speed up, the function of your macrophages and neutrophils. Maybe makes them a little bit better at carrying out phagocytosis. So it's thought to help out that way as well. Also stimulates your liver and your spleen to sequester iron and zinc. We need iron for our cells to be able to function properly uh, and some zinc and so do they. So it's thought that uh, increasing body temperature stimulates the liver and the spleen to hide, um, hold on to more of this uh, iron and zinc so that the uh, little microbes that are invading our body don't have an adequate supply. All right, that was kind of a quick overview of the immune system in general and then what we refer to as innate immunity. And I'm gonna stop there for now and I'm gonna do a second little video clip on your third line of defense, these adaptive immune defenses that require exposure before they work.